Thank you, Bill and Linda. And, uh, it's always a pleasure having you here, and it touches my heart. I need to probably schedule special music a little bit before my sermon because I'm touched when you, when you sing that song. It's just beautiful. Where's the promise of his coming? That was our key text, uh, that will be our key text in our sermon today. If you've been around a while like I have, it's likely that you've heard Christians say for many times during your life that Jesus was coming soon. In fact, people have been talking about the second coming of Jesus since the time of the disciples, approximately 2,000 years ago. And in one sense, they are all correct. You see, Jesus, in one sense, comes when we breathe our last breath, since for a Christian, his or her next breath will come from Jesus when he calls the righteous dead forth and from the grave at his second coming. We're going to look at a text here, and this is one of our key texts today. It's 2 Peter 3, and it says, First of all, no, without any doubt, and this is the Amplified Version, which I really like the Amplified. It says, first of all, no, without any doubt, that mockers will come in the last days with their mocking, following after their own human desires and saying, where's the promise of his coming and what has become of it? For ever since the fathers fell asleep in death, all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation. Nevertheless, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, pay attention to this, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Verse 9, the Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act and is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And then verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will vanish with a mighty and thunderous roar, and the material elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and the works that are on it will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be in the meantime in holy behavior? That is, in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer. And in godliness, that is, displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God. While you earnestly look for and await the coming of the day of God, for on this day the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the material elements will melt with intense heat. But in accordance with his promise, we, and what's that next word? It's sort of a big word. We expectantly await new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now we're going to look at the second coming in more depth today. It's certainly a certainty that the second coming is closer now than at any time in history. Each passing day is a day closer to the second coming. And as we just read in our key text today, God tells us to be diligently and earnestly looking for the second co coming. Another text here, Luke, uh, Luke 21. It says, even so, when you see these things taking place, understand and know that the kingdom of God is at hand. And then listen, verse 34. But take heed, take heed to yourselves and be on your guard, lest your hearts be overburdened. That day come upon you suddenly like a trap or a noose. That is, it's going to slip up on a lot of people, folks. And God is warning us, God is warning us about this very fact. He is wanting us to be uh, take heed and be watchful so that we're not caught awares. And thus, this should be something for us to understand. That is, the second coming is something that we need to study about to avoid this trap of complacency that a lot of the world exists in today. You see, hurricane and storm forecasts, they aren't always right on the mark, are they? But God's prophetic word will not fail in any respect. 
One of the parables that you've heard probably many times in the scriptures was about the wise and the foolish virgins that was recorded in Matthew 25. And Jesus talks about the ten virgins there. These were professed followers of Christ. They were Christians, folks. Let's don't get any, make any mistake about it. And they were waiting for the bridegroom, but not all of them were adequately prepared for his coming. They believed to some extent, but they were still unprepared when the time came. The door was shut just as the door to the ark was closed to the people in Noah's day who refused to heed the call before it was too late. We'll read a little portion of this in Matthew 25, verse 10. It says, those, this is the parable of the ten virgins, those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, that is the bridegroom, and the door was shut. Listen, verse 11, though, this is the warning. It says, afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. And then verse 13, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. If you look at what's happening in the world around us today, not that many people are really eagerly watching for the second coming. They are too busy with life's activities, or I might say life's distractions. You see, there are distractions all around us, and many are just consumed by all those distractions. They're running to and fro, going here and going there. You get on the expressways around here and everything. It's like little busy bees. You go to the malls, it's busy bees. People are even eating lunch, you know, including me. We're looking at our, our phones or checking our messages. There's distractions all over the place. And so at this time, This portion of our sermon at this juncture today, we could take a number of different paths or roads. And we could look at all the signs that foretell the second coming. But today, we're going to take a little bit of an unusual track. Today, I'd like for us to take a different approach and look at the time prophecies of the second coming. Now, many people shy away from time prophecies concerning the second coming and for good reason. You see, there's been a long, long list of failed time prophecies about when the second coming would take place. And when you look at this, and I I wish we had time to go over the list, it is just a huge list of these are just pretty important people that predicted when the second coming was. John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church, he thought that Jesus was going to return in 1836. William Miller of course, who led a lot of the, the movement before Adventists uh, came, you know, a lot of Adventists were part of this, but Adventist church was not established. They were Millerites. He predicted that Jesus was going to come in 1843, and then he didn't come then. He says, well, it's 1844. I made a mistake. Jesus didn't come in 1844. Herbert Armstrong He predicted three times. He predicted 1943, 1972, 1975. Jehovah's Witnesses, they predicted 1975. Pat Robertson, he predicted 1982 and then 2007. Jerry Falwell said 2000. Tim LaHaye said 2000. John Hagee said 2014 to 15. And the list goes on and on and on and on. So I'm not going to put my name on that list. But as Jesus says, no one knows the day nor the hour of the second coming. But God admonishes us repeatedly to be watchful and waiting. And so this includes studying Bible prophecies concerning the second coming. Now what I'd like for us to do today is look at, see if there's actually some time prophecies in the Bible. I don't know where all these dates came from. I'm sure they had a rhyme, a reason. Uh, except maybe for the people that said year 2000, you know, that was just a nice, nice number. Anyway, there's a rhyme and reason behind all this, but I'd like for us to look at the Bible and see if there's some more rhyme or reason for us to consider in general when the second coming is going to take place. It's important for us to look at Hebrews, the first chapter. And this is a very central text that we need to understand before we go any further in our, our study today. It says, God, who at what? 
various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. And so it's important for us to recognize that we would like to say, well, he's coming in uh, three years and three months and 21 days and at 10 o'clock in the morning. We'd like something real direct like that or to write it in the sky or, or do something. God sp- spoke in the, in the Bible in many different ways. And we're going to look at uh, a few of these. For example, when Abraham took Isaac, his only son, took him three days up into the mount to offer him as a sacrifice, there's more meaning to that than just superficially. This is a pr- prophecy actually pointing out to God the Father and Jesus the Son, our sacrifice. The entire sanctuary system was an acted out prophecy. Ezekiel 4, 6 shows us one of the many examples in scriptures. Uh, Ezekiel 4, 6, there we go. It says, and, and God is speaking to Ezekiel here. It says, and when you have completed them, and it's a lot of, a lot of text that goes with this. This is just one little snippet that I want to share with you. God tells Ezekiel, he says, Lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. And then he says, basically, he interprets that what the forty days represent. God says, I have laid on you a day for each year. And so the house of Judah was to experience this, not for forty days, but for forty years. And so this type of principle in the scripture is very important. It's an acted out prophecy, in this case by Ezekiel, but there's quite a number in the scripture. Have any of you ever, have you ever heard of six-day Adventists? You haven't. Well, I'm a six-day Adventist, and it's just a term that I have coined. It is not a denomination. It's not, I don't have my membership on any roll or anything like that. It's a descriptive term. And I'm going to explain to you what six-day Adventists are. And so you may change your mind and say, yeah, you know, I'm a six-day Adventist. You see, a a lot of people down through history have been six-day Adventists and didn't know it. And that's, again, because it's not a formal denomination but there's been six-day Adventists for a couple thousand years. And so you might say, what is a six-day Adventist? Well, these are people in various denominations, Christian denominations, that look at the creation week as representative of the plan of salvation where God recreates us. You see, in six days, literal days, God created the earth, didn't he? Including mankind. And he rested the seventh day. And so we look, I'm I'm the six-day Adventist, we look at the sixth day of creation to see the plan of salvation, his plan of recreation as being 6,000 years. And so this, this application here, we're going to look at it a little bit and see if there's any credibility to it. This, this belief that the six days of creation and the seventh day Sabbath correspond to 6,000 years where God tries to redeem man, the plan of salvation. And the 7,000, of course, is the Sabbath of the earth. It's the millennium, what we, we call. And so in, the, in a nutshell, that's what six-day Adventists are. I mean, you, you may subscribe to it. You're going to heaven whether you believe it or not. <laughs> but I want us to understand that that... God wants us to look at the second coming. And I think there's uh, examples in the scripture that God is pointing for us to understand this. And so we're going to look at it and see if it's any credibility. When you walk out of here today, you say, well, that makes sense. And some of you may walk out and say, that doesn't make any sense. Still good, folks. This, these, this premise here is coming from two texts. One's the Old Testament, Psalm 90, verse 4. And God says, For a thousand years in thy sight, or David is writing this, a thousand years in thy sight are but as as yesterday when it's past, and as a watch in the night. And so, you know, it equates a thousand years with a day. 2 Peter 3, 9, which we read a while ago, 
It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 8, but beloved, be not, what's that next word? Be not ignorant of this one thing. That is, God wants us to know about it, not be ignorant. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, if this was the only two texts in the Bible that uh, pointed out this, I could shrug it off personally. But let's take a few minutes and look at some other things in the Bible, see if there's any other passages that actually point forward to a 6,000-year period before Jesus returns as well. But before we get into that, let's acknowledge one thing. God has a plan. And just as he had a plan in creating this work, he timed everything out to work out for six days. And the seventh day, a day of rest in the creation. The plan of salvation is similar to that. It is a plan, folks. God does not make it up as time progresses. He doesn't get up this morning, not that God has to get up or anything, but I'm just using it as an analogy. God does not get up to today and say, well, we're going to do this today and all that. God has a plan for saving mankind. In fact, Ephesians 1.10 here, it says, He planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth. Isaiah 46.10, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Daniel eight nineteen. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, that is, God has a plan, at the time appointed, the end shall be. And so it's very clear that God has a plan and time date table for redeeming men. Let's look at a second aspect of this, the millennial Sabbath and other Sabbaths. You know, we're very, very comfortable with the knowledge of the Seventh-day Sabbath, and, but there are other Sabbaths in the Scripture. And, of course, one of them is the millennial Sabbath, and there's other Sabbaths as well. In fact, Revelation 20 contains six references to the thousand-year period, which we call the millennium, during which Satan will be confined to this desolate earth with all the dead wicked and no one to tempt. Revelation 22, it says, He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? A thousand years. See, Revelation teaches about this thousand years where the world will be desolate after the second coming and Satan will be confined to this earth with no one to tempt since the wicked are killed with the brightness of his coming. And so we not only have the seventh-day Sabbath at creation, God commanded that Israelites, every seventh year, something else was the rest. The land was to be given a rest every seventh year. In other words, the land would be desolate. Was this a prophecy that God was trying to teach us, or was this just good crop management from God? I believe that this was actually a prophecy, that God is trying to teach us something important. Leviticus 25, 4, it says, But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Leviticus 26, 34, Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it does what? As long as it lieth desolate. And ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. And so God's given us some principles here that we need to understand how to interpret. Isaiah 13, 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. That's what our subject matter is today, isn't it? The day of the Lord, cruel with bond, both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land, what? Desolate. That is the millennium. And he will destroy its sinners from it. Jeremiah 4, 7. The lion. You know, the lion sometimes referred to Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But the Bible also says that Satan walks around like a lion. The lion has come up from its 
thicket. And the destroyer, so we know who this is talking about, Satan. And the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. And so I believe that these passages teach us also about the millennial Sabbath when the earth will be desolate and uninhabited except by Satan, the destroyer. Revelation 23, let's look at it. And the angel hurled him, that is Satan, into the abyss and closed it and sealed it above him, preventing his escape or rescue, so that he would no longer deceive or seduce the nations until the thousand years were in the end. After these things... He, that is Satan, must be liberated for a short time. Now, we're going to change gears here for a second. Daniel 7.25 is a pretty important text. The Amplified Bible says, it says, He will speak things against the Most High God. That is, he's, this is God's enemy here. And wear down the saints of the Most High, and he will intend to change the times and the law, and they will be given unto his hand for a time, two times, and half the time. Now, we don't go around talking like that, do we? Say, we don't tell Carol that she's a time old <laughs> or two times or old or anything like that. But the Amplified Bible interprets this, and there's other prophecies that are parallel prophecies. And the Amplified Bible actually says that it's three and a half years. A time, two times is two years, uh, another two years. And then half the time is half a year. So it's three and a half years in all. And so time is not, we, we talk about time as just being generic. In the Bible, it's a specific, specific unit of time as well. The next uh, little uh, area that I'd like to share with you or story that you've probably heard many times is about Naaman, the Syrian, who had leprosy. And I think this is an important story from the Bible. It has some important spiritual teachings in addition to the superficial ones. To name a few, we had the witnessing of a little girl, or uh, in in Bible, a girl represents or a woman represents the church. She's witnessing to a Gentile, Naaman, who has leprosy, which in the Bible is another symbol of sin. And so Naaman tries to buy healing from Elisha, the prophet of God, but healing was not for sale from God's prophet. Just as salvation cannot be bought with silver or gold. We have Naaman, who's a great general and too proud at first, but finally he humbles himself to immerse himself in the old dirty Jordan River, not once, but seven times as directed by the prophet. Remember, time in the Bible is not only a general term, it can also be a specific measurement of time. Second Kings, uh, the fifth chapter, says, So he, Naaman, went down and plunged himself in, into the Jordan. How many times? Seven. Seven times, just as the man of God had said. And his flesh, this is important here. You, sometimes you might go across it at 75 miles an hour and you miss it. It says, His flesh was restored like that of a little child, and he was clean. And so when we think of this in terms of spiritual terms, there's one time when we're going to be restored like that, folks. When the dead come up out of the grave again. You may go down into the grave wrinkled, two arms uh, amputated, all sorts of diseases upon you, cancer eating you up and all that stuff. When you come forth out of the grave, when Jesus calls the righteous forth, you're going to come forth in perfect youth and, and your, your skin will be like that of a little child. And not only that, you will be clean. That is, you will not have a sinful body. You will come up incorruptible. And so I'm asking you a question in your mind is that did the Jordan River have any curative properties? Absolutely not. And what was so special that Naaman had to dip in the Jordan River seven times? Did he scrub a little bit and then go down and come back up and scrub some more and finally, you know, it cleared? I don't think so. It's the seventh time. And could it be that this is an illustration that after 6,000 years, sin, that is lepers, represented by leprosy in this miracle, shall be washed away and the righteous will be raised incorruptible in the youth of their life 
after 6,000 years. So that's a thought question for us. The fifth one example I'd like to share with you is Elijah and Mount Carmel. I think most everyone has heard the story of Elijah and the confrontation with the Baal priest on Mount Carmel. And we've heard the story about Elijah praying for rain that had been withheld for three and a half years. Like Naaman, God wanted to teach us another lesson. He was not out to lunch or ignoring Elijah's prayers. After all, God had just sent fire down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, the altar rocks, the 12 barrels of water. Six times Elijah prayed. God was not out to lunch, folks. Don't Let's just get that clear. God heard all six times, but he waited just like Naaman had to dip himself seven times. The seventh time when he came up, he was uh, clean. And in this case, six times Elijah prayed, but the seventh time Elijah's servant saw something different. We're going to read that in 1 Kings 18.43. And it says, And Elijah said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea, and that is he, the servant, went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And Elijah said, Go again. And he said this seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he, Elijah's servant, said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he, that is, Elijah said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot. And get thee down that the rain stop thee not. So I, I think that we can see another connection with the second coming. Matthew 24, 30, in fact, is just one of quite a number of texts. It says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And you can also look at Daniel 7, 13 and Revelation 14, 14. And so are these just, again, the six times and God using the seventh time to produce this, this miracle? Could these six times, again, represent 6,000 years? And then Jesus will be seen coming in the clouds of glory at the seventh thousandth year. The fall of Jericho. Right before the children of Israel entered the promised land, they had to deal with the city of Jericho. Recall that God told them something very strange about this, too. He didn't say go up and do a battering ram and we'll knock the walls down or anything like that. He told them something very explicitly what to do. The Israelites were to march around the city once each day for six days, the seventh day, they were to march around it seven times, blow the trumpets, which is a sign of war, and it's a sign of the second coming, too. And the walls of the city would be destroyed, and so there was a reason for this plan. You see, the city of Jericho was on probation in those six days, and the trumpets were blown, the city was destroyed. You see, we're on probation, this earth is on probation. And Jesus will come. Trumpets will be blown as the king of kings comes to save and deliver his people. And the wicked will be destroyed. Everyone in Jericho was destroyed except Rahab and her family who had faith in God. Another example, a uh, story of King Joash. 2 Kings 11 and 2 Chronicles 22 records the story of, about a wicked queen. Her name was Athaliah. She tried to destroy all the royal seed and almost succeeded. However, Joash was the rightful and only royal king of Israel. And he was hidden in the temple of God for how many years? Six years. While the wicked queen, Athaliah, she reigned in his place. Something else is happening on this earth. Someone else is reigning during these 6,000 years on this earth. But the rightful king is coming. Second Chronicles 22, 12. It says, And he, Joash, was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while the wicked queen, Athaliah, reigned over the land. And again, Satan is reigning over this earth, but not for long. You see, Joash was the rightful heir to the kingdom, and he was brought forth and crowned king. And the wicked queen usurper, she was put to death. 
King Joash began to reign in the seventh year. The second Chronicles 24.1. It says Joash was seven years old when he became king. And so if we have one year representing a thousand years, this would be the, the uh, beginning of the millennium year. And he reigned four years in Jerusalem. I personally believe the rightful king of this earth will take over this earth and the wicked will be destroyed at the end of 6,000 years, just like this wicked queen was. No, number eight, Jesus transfigured on the mount. Let's look at this and see what's in it. Mark 9, 2, it says, Now after how many days? Six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a the high mountain apart from themselves. And he was what? transfigured before them that is and then we have the description of what's transfigured his clothes jesus's clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow as such as no launder on earth can whiten them jesus this is representing him coming as king of king and lords of lord number nine moses in six days on the mount let's see what this Exodus twenty four sixteen And the glory of the Lord abode upon the Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it how long? Six days. And the seventh day, he, that is God, called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. We've seen some, heard some of these terms before, haven't we? On the top of the mount, on the eyes of the, in the eyes of the children of Israel, and Moses went into the midst of the cloud, and... And got him up into the mount. That is, Moses ascended, just like the righteous will ascend with the second coming. And so the question is, could this be another mini prophecy of 6,000 years before the righteous are taken up into the clouds to be with the Lord uh, at his second coming? The Lord waited in the cloud for six days. You know, he could have done it the second day, third day, fourth day. God does things for a purpose. Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds. Second Thessalonians 2 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Number 10, Enoch. Enoch. Enoch was translated without seeing death. And Jude 1 14 has something interesting to say about that. It says, and Enoch also, the how many? Seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. And so it's connecting in this text the number seven, translation, and the second coming of the Lord. Number 11, slaves set free. In the Bible, often, uh, in, even in the Hebrew economy, slaves worked for six years. The seventh year, they were to be set free from bondage. And the Bible teaches that we are all slaves to sin and in bondage until Jesus redeems us and purchases us. us. Deuteronomy 15, 12. And if thy brother and Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman be sold unto thee and shall... Or, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. God is teaching us a principle here. Luke 4, 18. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And this is not just talking about people that are in prison. That was spiritual captives to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And this is not talking about just physically blind, but spiritually blind folks. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Twelve, cleansing of the leper. And this is under the, uh, there's a law of the leper. Leviticus 14, verse 8. And I've told you, I'd like to take all the pronouns out of the Bible because it's, when it comes to he, you have to figure out who the he is. But he, the leper that is to be cleansed, shall wash his clothes and sh shave off his hair and wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent. How many days? Seven days. But it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave all his hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all the hair that he shall shave off. He shall wash his clothes. Also, he shall wash his flesh in water and he shall be clean. Folks, 
I don't care how many baths you took today or this morning or last night or last week. We're all dirty with sin in our lives. But Jesus, he makes us clean, and he will make us clean when he comes again. He will cleanse us. He cleanses us when he forgives us. And again, leprosy here was a symbol of sin. The leper was not considered clean until the seventh day. And likewise, it's my belief, my personal belief, that the world will not be cleansed from sin until 6,000 years is over, and then the 7,000, the earth will be cleansed. People will be cleansed. Number 13, the last, the year of Jubilee, which is the 50th year. Leviticus 25, 8 says, And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years, that's 49 years, for yourself seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of Jubilee. Trumpet of Jubilee is something that's important, folks. It's announcing the king here. The trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the what? Seventh month on the day of atonement, which is a pretty important day in my book. You shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his possessions. That is, there will be complete restoration. God's creation will again be reclaimed by him at the second coming. And so in conclusion, these texts that we've studied are very important as I personally believe that they prophesy about the culmination of this earth's history. There will come a day, without any doubt, an appointed time in which probation will end for the inhabitants of earth. Probation will end for man. There will be a trumpet blast throughout the entire earth. The righteous dead will be resurrected. God's people will be liberated and cleansed from sin. And while the Day of Atonement taught forgiveness through the substitutionary death of Jesus, the Jubilee, Jubilee taught about God's plans to restore man so that, that had so often sold themselves into the slavery. Stories in the Bible, such as the fall of Jericho, have rich meaning in God's spe specific directions to Israel. The laws of the Sabbath of the land provide parallels to the plan of salvation in the thousand-year Sabbath, the millennium of the land and earth. This could very well be the end of the 6,000 years, which will be very soon. I personally believe that the world events all around us are warning Christians at the, of the closeness of the end of time. No one knows the day nor the hour, but God does give us warnings and tell us to look for the signs of his coming. Our calculation of time is not exact, but it is definitely close. The signs are all around us. The world's leaders and legislatures appear to be powerless to deal with the financial, climate, political, other issues that grip the world. Hatred and division is getting worse all over the earth. You and I have no control over all that. However, we do have control over the way in which we live our lives and whether we are faithful and obedient to our Lord and Savior. You see, this earth is just a testing place. Will we be faithful and obedient to all of God's commands? Will we trust in him completely to take care of us and to save us from our sins? Will we accept his sacrifice, his robe of righteousness to cover us? Will we accept his precious sacrifice of his life and blood to pay our debt of sins? Will we be vigilant and not distracted by the cares of this world around us? These are questions that we should ask ourselves each day. We should be praying for faith and wisdom and guidance during these last days of Earth's history. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus comes back to this Earth. I'm not looking for, forward to the time of tribulation, but I am tired of sickness and death and famine and violence and sin all around us. We can trust God to provide for our needs as he always has, I'm homesick for heaven, as the song says, and I trust you share that sentiment. Isaiah 59, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened at all, that it cannot save, nor his ear dull with deafness, that it cannot hear. Jesus will hear our prayer if we are faithful to him. 
And so may the Lord bless all of his people. May we be faithful to the very end is my prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would just illuminate our minds as we read the scriptures and help us to understand the things that are written there. Help us to be diligent and help us to be expecting the, the second coming. We pray, dear Lord, that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that you will give us wisdom. We pray that our faith will go stronger and that you will give us a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Bless us, dear Lord, and again, help us to be faithful to the very end is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.